Hi, I'm Jen Rogers at NASDAQ Market Site, and this is Breakthrough Economy. Today we explore the groundbreaking potential of cell and gene therapies and look at what it means for patient outcomes now and in the future. I'm joined by Ali Ehrman, Genomic Revolution Analyst at ARK Invest, and Sam Kulkarni, CEO at CRISPR Therapeutics. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And Sam, I want to start with you. There have been a lot of defining advancements in cell and gene therapy over the past few years, but I want you to talk about the next generation of therapies and, and what you think is going to define it. Will it be by curing our most nefarious diseases like cancer or solving everyday issues like cholesterol? Thank you for having me. Um, we're in a very exciting period in the advancement of science and technology for biomedical innovation. Uh, it's only been 10 years since the advent of CRISPR, uh, the technology. And here we are on the cusp of a BLA filing, which means that we're gonna bring it to patients commercially for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Uh, at CRISPR Therapeutics we recently announced data that showed that 31 of 31 sickle cell patients treated with the CRISPR-based cell therapy had a functional cure. Uh, and that's just astounding and remarkable uh, and shows the power of the next generation cell therapies. But we're just scratching the surface at this point. I think the as we go forward, the engineering is advancing, the science is advancing, and we're gonna see next generation cell therapies go from rare diseases all the way to common diseases and actually, cholesterol is not that far-fetched. You know, we have a program where we're uh, editing certain genes in the liver that will lower your LDL cholesterol for life from a one-time intervention. Uh, we're actually making cell therapies that produce insulin that would take away the needs for need for every uh, week or every day insulin injections. Uh, so the future is bright, uh, and there are a lot of possibilities for patients suffering from these diseases. Um, Alec, just to bring you in here, I mean, you focus on gene editing, stem cell, and novel immunotherapy technologies at ARC. And when you listen to Sam talk about all the potential here, do you think investors have a good grasp of the opportunities and advancements? I mean, where do, where do you see the biggest opportunities that uh, we might be missing right now? You know, Sam mentioned some great ones, and I think investors are certainly watching this space carefully. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about ARC and differentiates us is that all of our backgrounds are from non-traditional finance backgrounds. So, for example, I was doing cancer research at Sloan Kettering. My partner, Simon Barnett, was more of an engineering background. And I think this makes us poised to find these opportunities. I think Sam gave some really interesting uh, examples of some of the opportunities that we see as important going from these rare diseases like sickle and beta thal to some of the more common diseases like Sam mentioned in cardiovascular diseases, um, which obviously CRISPR therapeutics and also Verb Therapeutics, another portfolio company in ARKG are working on, are, are really going to be quite transformative and also are going to take our healthcare system more from, you know, a downstream approach. So treating someone once they already have a cancer, for example, to a more upstream approach, like can we get to someone before they have a heart attack just because they're at risk for having a heart attack. Um, I also think next gen CRISPR approaches are very interesting, like base editing. So, you know, not doing the double stranded DNA break. We're watching the space carefully and I think investors are as well. Uh, Sam, let's drill down on some of the successes with cellular immunotherapies and talk about what's next in store for the immuno-oncology cell therapy. And we heard Ali talking a little bit about base editing and this idea also of off the shelf technology versus the personalized, which can take a lot longer. Uh, what, what's in store for us in the immuno-oncology space? If we're going to look at cancer care very differently in the coming years. Um, you know, if you look at the last 60 years of the modern war against cancer, we've tried everything in our, in our hands from toxic chemicals all the way to antibodies and small molecules to try and cure cancer. Uh, and oftentimes, as, as we think about cancer care, you know, you see images of patients with hair loss, with pain, uh, nephropathy, and neuropathies, and all that. And, you know, what we have now is a very different way of treating cancers. We're retraining our immune cells to go attack the cancers. And in the first instance of it, we took the patient's own immune cells, retrained it to go recognize the cancer and kill it. And that showed remarkable success but that doesn't reach all the patients that deserve and need this care. What we're doing is using CRISPR to create an off the shelf immunotherapy. So we take a young, healthy person's immune system, retrain it, engineer those cells 
so that there's smart cells that can go recognize and kill the cancers, not just in heme malignancies or blood cancers, but also in solid tumors. Um, that can be revolutionary because one, it's a one-time treatment. Two, it's much safer. You don't have all the toxicities associated with cancer care. And here we have a one-time treatment that could be in the future curative and cancer won't be the same as we know it today. Ali, do you think it can scale and that the cost can come down to make this practical uh, across the board? We highlighted three different avenues. So the first was we looked at autologous to allogeneics. So just what Sam mentioned, more of kind of using your own cells versus using an off-the-shelf approach. We also highlighted shifts from going from liquid tumor to solid tumor because liquid tumor, we have a gold standard. And we also know that solid tumors are 88% of all diagnosed tumors. Um, so very important unmet need, but also huge market opportunity. Um, and we looked at how long Long that could actually take. Um, and we hypothesized using Gleevec as an example, which is an oral chemotherapy. Um, that took about 10 years of clinical trials, seven of which were for solid tumor. So we hypothesized using Gleevec as an example that the first CAR T for solid tumors um, could be approved in 2025. Um, so that would be great. But from a cost perspective, we actually did some work on this as well. And we found that per life year, um, actually having some of these therapies, which maybe are more expensive, but potentially could be one-time doses um, or just maybe less chronic and fewer doses could actually be cheaper on a cost per life year basis. So Sam, in addition to all the excitement and advances that we're seeing in the cancer space, there's also the potential application for autoimmune disorders, uh, infectious diseases, which uh, we've all become uh, very familiar with. What are some of the specific ways that this is being applied right now? Yeah, and don't forget neurodegenerative diseases. You know, one of the big things we're going to face as society over the next 20 years are diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's that, uh, that are going to be you know, debilitating as people live longer. And I think these cell therapies are now being advanced in autoimmune diseases, as you said, where you can actually engineer cells again to prevent uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, and this can also be curative. Uh, you can do transplant procedures uh, with modified cells for autoimmune diseases. Uh, in infectious diseases, you can use CRISPR gene editing potentially to cure hepatitis B. Um, these are diseases that have been very hard to address with small molecules or antibodies. Um, so you're looking at uh, a number of disease areas where people are going to advance these, these therapies, whether in the form of cell therapies or gene therapies. Um, and you're going to see more and more data come out. And by the way, to the cost equation that you just alluded to previously, um, you know, we're very passionate about bringing these therapies to patients around the world. Um, I grew up in India personally, and I'm, I'm very interested in saying, how can we create medicines that not only can address the patient population in the U.S. and Western Europe, but all, all around the world? And in the, in the case of cancers, you know, because you're using a healthy donor, a young healthy donor as a source for these cell therapies, you can create thousands of doses. And the patient's body then becomes the biofactor where you expand the cells and make more of it. Um, and eventually, I think these can be... Uh, pretty important in, in India, China, and other countries because you're kind of leapfrogging from the, small, the antibody world, from small molecules all the way to cell therapies. Um, and I think all of these, whether it's cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune, infectious diseases, they're all going to be available globally. Ali, when you look at this space um, and for investors, is this a place where there's going to be multiple winners for a disease? or a category, or is it a winner-take-all situation? Yeah, we actually believe there could be multiple winners. Um, you know, how we think about evaluating stocks and, and maybe looking at some of these companies is we do a very top down and bottoms up research process. Um, so one of the things we do is we size the opportunity and then we also do very detailed company models. And we highlighted that gene editing and gene therapy companies could scale about 54%. That's at a compound annual growth rate. Um, and it could be at about 130 billion to 1.1 trillion by 2026. And then we also show that by 2026, the share of R&D spending devoted to gene editing and gene therapy companies 
could grow from 3% to 17%. So, you know, we don't believe that this is a, a winner takes all. We believe that this is going to create a new vertical in which it's going to go cross pipeline, right? So we've talked about oncology, we've talked about infectious diseases, we've talked about autoimmune diseases, Sam brought up, you know, neuro. So it, it's not just going to be for one indication or one specific, um, you know, pipeline asset, it's going to go so much deeper and broader than that. But Sam, I mean, you live and breathe this every day, so it's no surprise to you. But when you listen to Ali speaking about sizing of the opportunity, I mean, do you sometimes feel like there's a mismatch between the actual innovation, what's going on, and the, the valuations in a way, or the attention? Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, if you think about the overall pharma market, there's about, you know, $2.5 trillion ascribed to all the pharma companies that are still somewhat living in a in a world where they focus on small molecules or antibodies. And what we have here is cell and gene therapies that are gonna form a whole new category of medicines that could be a third or more of the, the entire uh, pharma market in the next five to 10 years. And, and I think it takes time for some of the bigger companies to switch and shift to where the innovation's happening, but it also takes time for investors to switch that mindset. And, and you've seen that with the antibody space in the 80s, it took a while for people to recognize the potential of it, but today half the pharma market is antibodies, but it took 20 years in some cases. Um, but, but you know, what's amazing, and I, I'm here in Boston, which has become the epicenter of uh, some of the biomedical uh, revolution or all the research, you know, what we're learning about human genomics, about what our genes encode, what we're learning about all the delivery technologies so we can get these medicines to different organs, what we're learning about the different modalities like gene editing and mRNA, and mRNA just was so important in this whole COVID crisis. This is all coming together, and the confluence of this innovation is going to get recognized pretty quickly. And we're going to see more recognition, but more importantly, we're going to see more meaningful drugs that impact patients. And that's what this is all about. Sam and Ali, thank you both so much for joining us. It's been fascinating to get to talk with you. I'm Jen Rogers.